Like we've had people copy our stuff. There's a part of me that just laughs. Like I'm, someone's like, Are you, aren't you angry? I'm like, they have copied every poor decision I've made. <laughs> I have recently been experimenting with our support team and retooling them from a support team into a product team. Yeah, if you are a company that cares about surviving in, in this environment, like you, that's what you're gonna have to do. Welcome for those who are new here. This is a monthly webinar that I run as part of Product Pathways, where we kind of cover different topics around product. Uh, we've done ones in the past about product roadmaps, user interviews, those types of things are all um, topics to help you be better at product and do product better. Today, super excited because we get to do something a little bit different uh, than like my past webinars. And hopefully we do more of this, I think, going forward. So we have Kanan here, uh, founder of Align With. I'm gonna give Quick little introduction on Kanan. So Kanan and, I, Kanan and I have been talking for a little while now. Uh, honestly, I love every single time we talk, we always talk for way too long. We have way too many great <laughs> things to talk about. And and I thought who better to sit down and have a conversation with and talk about some, some things that product managers face. Uh, in particular, an important topic that is on everyone's mind is AI. And Kanan is a serial founder. He's founded three companies now. One of them got acquired. He's still running two of them. And one of them is Align With. Align With is an AI tool for product managers, helping you to be able to communicate and align. Uh, Kanan will probably be able to give a better uh, pitch and description on that one, but a little bit more about Kanan. So not only serial entrepreneur, um, CPO, definitely a product builder. Uh, you know, when, when somebody has their company get acquired and then the first thing they do is just go and start like another company i think that <laughs> speaks volumes to like you just like you're just a builder you just want to keep keep doing things yeah. and uh, mad respect for that uh, some other fun facts kanan brews his own beer <laughs> and i found out the other day he spent a decade doing traditional chinese medicine so a man of many talents i think <laughs> yeah so welcome welcome kanan and welcome everyone thank you Thanks for having me. This is uh, super exciting, kind of being able to, you know, chat with you in front of all these other people and just kind of share some of our great discussions. And uh, it's been really great getting to know you and now, you know, to uh, talk to you know, everyone here in the webinar. Yeah. And I'm pretty keen for this. Uh, we'll, we'll even chat in the other day and we had to pause ourselves and be like, let's save it for today because we could, <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> could easily talk, <laughs> talk forever, uh, a couple of hours on that. So I wanted to start, um, you know, obviously AI is all the buzz right now. Uh, people are very focused on how it's shaping the world. One of the things we, we talked about the other day that I wanted to to really just start with because I thought it was a really interesting conversation is one, love to get your take on how AI is shaping the world today. But you kind of challenged me on this one and you're like, well, let's start like how might it change the world in three years or even, you know, two years, three years, four years, five years. Like that's another realm. Yeah. So love to get your take. On yeah. That. So, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, where AI is today, um, you know, is a lot of where people's focus goes into because they're kind of looking at like where the hockey puck is. And I think like when we think about, you know, what does it look like? I'm, I mean, it's even hard to imagine three years from now. I mean, you know, Mark Zuckerberg just, you know, announced he's dumping a hundred billion dollars into, you know, Llama 3. I mean, the amount of resources that's going into um, the technology to either, you know, reduce the cost or, um, you know, you know, maybe at some point get to, uh, a, you know, AGI or, or something <laughs> to that point, um, is, is massive. Right. And, um, so where it's going is like really, really hard to say, and you can kind of look at like where it is now and, and understand that, like, you know, what, what can we leverage it for right now? Um, it's like, what does it do really well? Right. What does it not do really well? Um, but this is all temporary. Right. So if you start to look ahead, I think, I don't think that there's a single point in time where there's been like, other than maybe the dawn of the internet, where like people have so quickly adopted a technology, maybe the cloud. I don't, I don't know. There, you know, there's just, there, there are a few points in time where you see this kind of adoption and it's happening everywhere from, you know, government, military, 
um, product, you know, software, um, you know, it's, it's, it's happening everywhere. There's probably not a single company that isn't trying to figure out their AI play. So <laughs> it's changing everything everywhere. Yeah. I, you know, <laughs> maybe less with like beer making, <laughs> but still, I think there's probably a component there as well that yeah, will eventually kind of go into these spaces where, um, you know, you think are, are, are kind of safe from AI, like, you know, just like making physical products or baking a cake, like being a baker or something like that. Right. So, I mean, your beer making is safe, which is at least for now, <laughs> which is <laughs> probably a nice thing to have. It's, it's, it's an interesting one. I wanted to say, um, cause you mentioned AGI just define AGI, like what it is for those who might not have, for those who heard that, it might've been like, what are you going on about? Oh, it's artificial general intelligence. And it's what everyone's afraid of when it comes, when they talk about AI, it's going to take over our jobs. I mean, that is really kind of the, the biggest, um, part of the conversation. It's when you hear Elon Musk talking about AI, this is what, this is, this is where, you know, things get scary and it, it begins to possess the ability to do things um, as we do them, as humans do them, either at or beyond our cap current capabilities, right? So um, it, it, it is honestly when it's like, well, AI is going to take over your job. Well, AI, you know, AGI is the one thing that is actually, you know, has that potential, right? Like right now, it, there's there's just what AI is doing is, is able to kind of like relieve some of the pressure um, to kind of take away a lot of the grunt work. And that's where it's like, oh, how does it affect us today? It's like, well, do you need a junior coder? Maybe you won't um, in the next year, right? Um, do you need a, a junior PM? I mean, if you're doing a lot of like using AI to write everything from PRDs to specs to kind of everything else that we're kind of playing with, um, yeah, it starts to kind of, so, so how does a junior even become senior? Like, that's like another question, right? And I, and I, and, and a thought came into my head, which is like, well, I make music, I probably see some, some gear in the background and, you know, you used to have to learn to play an instrument, right? Of the violin or, and then, then you had sampling, right? Where you could sample and then you can put it through MIDI and then start to kind of play with like tone, right? Oh, look, I don't even need to play the violin. I can do it on a keyboard, but you're still like manually doing that. Right. And now, I mean, you could just use your voice through, you know, uh, software and pick any instrument you want. And I just played around with, with an app, uh, I believe it's called Sona, if I'm not mistaken, but that one, you could literally say, I, you know, I want to like Egyptian, Turkish, you know, uh, traditional music with, IDM and it's it's a, it's going to come up with some kind of crazy blend to, to make a beat and I think like when you look at that evolution right in our own lifetime of just like you had to learn an instrument then you had sampling and then you know you have like these other ways of being able to use like synthesizers with sampled instruments and then your voice and I think you know that kind of evolution of making music it's perhaps kind of this this evolution of like how we do work yeah one of the things that like we talked about the other day you just made me think about uh which is i mean the junior conversation is a very interesting one and but the grunt work i think like today it's really good at the grunt work there's some products out there you can look them up um won't necessarily name some but you give them some prompts and they'll do like wireframes for you so like that wireframing mm -hmm. skill almost goes away but uh Keen to hear your thoughts around what, where's that limitation today? And then, you know, will that limitation go away? I guess. Yeah. 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 You know, there's, <clears throat> it's so cool, right? It's like magic. Wow. You have this thing, right? That, 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 that moment you, you open Pandora's box and you're like, you know, the magic comes out and, you know, but there's also another side to that, which is like, what AI definitely doesn't do well is like creative stuff like not as good as us right at this point. And so like your, these results that you get back from these tools are like, yeah, it saved me some time or it's good, but it's not great. 
it isn't like when you sit down with your designer, you validate designs, you go through this whole process of really coming up with something unique and genuine, right? Like that just speaks to your brand. Um, you know, that's something that's like very difficult. And I think even as it starts to get better, you have a content moderation problem, even with design, right? Where you have, you know, cause as AI, you know, you know, trains itself on information, whether it's from, you know, books uploaded or the internet or wherever, it's going to eventually start consuming its own stuff. <laughs> right. And I think, I think some people are trying to tackle that right now, but it is like, it's a problem. You can, you, it's like a punch that's like coming in slow motion. You're like, okay, well, um, like, you know, we're used, talking about music, you know, uh, you know, just like music, you know, if you, if you're recording something like, you know, at, at a poor quality, it's hard to, to make it sound good again. Right? It's like garbage in garbage out. And I think that, if AI starts feeding on itself, I don't know. I don't know that that's going to be a good thing for, um, you know, like the tools you mentioned, like design tools, because everything's just going to become so generic. It's, you know, I think you're going to really, this, this is just my thoughts, right? Like, I think there are solutions to these problems though, but that's kind of a problem you can kind of look at and say, all right, I think, you know, right now that's really awesome. But what does that look like in three years when it starts consuming this data that we kind of shrug our shoulders at and go, it's all right. It's good enough for now. You know, and I think there's a lot of people that build products that are okay with good enough, right? There are a few people that are like focused on creating like really, really great things, right? That's, that's tends to be the minority. And, and I think this ties well into what you were saying with the senior role versus juniors. Like you still need that senior person to look at it all, or, or, or at least the, the creativity part of the job, which we only build through experience and building that product sense and that design sense to, to kind of pull it together. I always think of like AI consuming itself as like um, constantly trying to photocopy like the same piece of paper. Like they'll work a few times and then eventually oh, yeah, <laughs> it starts exactly. to fade and yeah, fade yeah. and fade. Like, and that's an interesting, like, this is a hypothesis. We don't know if this is going to happen, but you could, we start to, I guess, think about that as like a possibility. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's also this idea of like, you know, I, I used to be an artist, right? Photographer, um, I did like music events and all this stuff. So like, you know, I was a starving artist and, you know, looking at the way things are going. I do wonder whether it's it's going to be a starving coder and not a starving artist where like the artists become really um more like you just won't have a time because that's there's 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 a need for that creativity right that where that becomes kind of the core focus over maybe the technical capabilities of you know someone uh, who's honed their craft as, as a developer. Right. So, um, yeah, maybe it may flip over on the head. You won't have starving artists. You'll have like, you know, fully employed artists all the time. With paychecks. For the, for like the product people like listening. Um, I think that's been the general advice, uh, which is like the role's not necessarily going away, but like if your role if the large portion of your role today is a lot of the non-art side of the job, right? The more science, analytical, doing admin tasks, that type of stuff, then yes, that's probably going to go away. But that is both an opportunity and also a threat. Like it's a threat if that's the only thing you do, because then companies can look at it and say, well, your role is replaceable. But it's also an opportunity to say, well, if I can offload all of this admin stuff, I can start to focus more on the creativity side of the role, which is hopefully the higher leverage part and the, the, the more fun part. I don't know what your thoughts around that one is. Yeah. I mean, I see that as, as, um, a possibility and, or let me rephrase that. It seems more like a reality, right? Where, you know, um, it's, it's either, you know, right now, like shifting your focus from, you know, doing grunt work to being able to actually get to stuff that you've been wanting to get to, or maybe just taking the workload off of a PM so that they can, you know, function more effectively. I think that's definitely, um, 
going to be like, I mean, I think that's what's happening now, right? That's, that's the stuff that we're focused on. Like, how do we take the work away from PM so that they can actually get to the stuff that we aspirationally talk about in, in product process, right? Whether it's, uh, hey, let's build, measure, learn, a lot of focus on building, a lot of focus on measuring, great tools to measure, and then this, where do we find the time to actually learn, uh, do research, to gather data, to validate. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, I think that's, you know, going to allow them to focus more on, on those things. And as far as like, yeah, juniors, yeah, I think that's, perhaps the thing where like they, they'll just skip a lot of the stuff that we had to deal with and we kind of bring them like start like training them on this kind of uh, more mid-level process. We'll kind of like shift from like junior does this kind of grunt work to kind of step into a more, um, you know, creative or, or data-driven role. Yeah. Like almost, not necessarily having to start with a lot of the delivery stuff or, or, or um, some of the admin stuff and because all that's taken care of, being able to jump straight into the more strategy. Right, exactly. Discovery. They just get to skip a grade. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like skip a few years of school. Yeah, Come just, on. just like, hop on. join the big leagues. Yeah. yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump into some of the questions that have come through uh, in the chat. I'm keen to, to do that. I have some other ones and we'll jump back to that because I know we, we touched on kind of the space that I think like you're trying to solve in this space, which I think is interesting, but we'll get back to it. I want to get through some of these. Yeah, sure, There's a please. question here. I'm going to pop it up on the screen for you to be able to read it as well. Okay. Um, a question around product management for, as a product manager for AI, what's stopping us right now from thinking ahead, this conundrum between what marketing brochures say now versus understanding what problems to solve in the future. And, and this ties really nicely into what we started with. And you know, you talked about trying to imagine what the future is. We're very focused on like following that hockey puck uh, right now. You know, I look at this and I think, how do we stop? How do we make sure we're not getting sucked into the hockey puck? Like, you know, it's like five year olds playing playing football and you're just running around or soccer. They're just running around chasing the ball. Like, <laughs> how do we not do that and and be a bit more strategic? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of stuff that kind of prevents us from kind of thinking ahead or even innovating. I mean, you know, when, when, when you're working with AI in, in the state that it is today, right? So you have these companies that want to build these features. Uh, the business side of it is that these AI, the costs are high and, you know, a lot of them are, are coming down, right? There's a big effort to kind of reduce these costs. Um, so I think what's preventing us from like th not like thinking ahead is because I think that there's there's so much that we can do, but we're kind of throttled by business cases. Like, okay, can we do this with AI? Does it make sense? Sure, but what's that going to cost? And a lot of times, those costs are just not something that the business can can float. And so you've got um, I think a lot of like throttling of innovation based on costs, but I think that's going to go away over the next year. As that starts to go away, companies like us and other companies are going to be able to take massive amounts of data um, and, and be able to do so much more with it than we can do today. Um, what's stopping us from like looking ahead is I think that we don't know what technologies are being created. And I think that a lot of AI companies are keeping it close to the vest, right? Like they're dumping a lot of money in, but we, we don't know, like, what are the tools that they're going to give us to be able to, to, you know, create from, right? Like they're giving us our, our, our toolkit. And I think, so there's a lot of assumption, you know, uh, that has to go into like, well, what will this look like in a year or two? And, you know, why aren't things moving fast enough now? I think um, those are some of my thoughts, right? Like, we, we struggle with that, right? Okay, we could do this with AI, but that's, that's you know, the costs are too high to do something like that. Or, um, yeah, we just, don't, we just don't know what things are going to look like in a year. And a lot of these companies aren't necessarily going to share that information quite yet. And how, how, do, you, how, do, how do you and the team kind of, deal with that or what 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 advice would you give somebody in that space because like there's one to say 
okay, we're business case driven. Totally get that. Um, you know, viability is not there or feasibility is not there. Do we put it on the someday shelf and almost like on the ice box and and hope that okay, when when oh, cost yeah. comes oh, yeah. down, let's let's open that box and <laughs> yeah. You know. Oh, I have a whole list. Yeah, like, <laughs> I'm sure. Okay, sure you, do. you know, if you know, as the costs come down, um, there's just there's you know, the creativity starts to increase in terms of what you can do because it's not cost prohibitive anymore. You know, um, and I think that that is definitely like a big factor, at least for me. I think in terms of looking ahead, you know, the 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 problem is like we're all given the same tools to work with, right? So if I can do something, you could probably do it too, right? <laughs> like, um, and so really, I think a lot of like use cases for AI in order to have something unique is how do you take that and apply it against a proprietary, you know, let's say data set or something that gives you an edge as a company to be able to make business decisions that aren't necessarily product related, you know, like as, you know, those costs come down, um, I think that, you know, they're, you know, if you, especially for larger companies, right? Like being able to um, be able to use the AI in cases for not just product innovation, but, you know, critical like decision making around around the business or um, having some proprietary feature that's tied to their either you know physical or software product right that's that someone can't just easily replicate because they don't have that data right they don't have that insight that they could feed the ai and i think that's where things start to get a little bit more like how do you how do you protect yourself if everyone has the same you know ammunition and, and the same you know the same weaponry, right? <laughs> like, I, I think it really comes down to like the data. I mean, I mean, that's it. like it's an interesting thought because like this this reminds me of uh, I swear I probably read a tweet or something like this that was like if your if your strategy is AI, like it's it's not a strategy, right? <laughs> and, and this probably comes to your point, which is if everyone has access to the same models or tools that we're all leveraging, i.e., OpenAI or something like that, right? Uh, then it can't be a strategy because that's not like it's not defensible. It's not it's not hard to copy. It's not like it's very easy for people to do. And then I guess what you're saying is the data is the data is the space that you think is where. I mean, is there others? Yeah, I think there's two sides actually. Now that we're like kind of talking about it, I'm like you know, the gears are turning. It's like yeah, I, I think like you know the data set that you have to train the AI on makes that data unique, right? That's something that perhaps your competitors may not have. At the same time, it's like, okay, well, you know, these are technical solutions. And when we think about, you know, product, um, this is where design becomes like far more important, like user experience and design matter, right? Um, it, it's it, the way people perceive, use and function your product. We can have, we can both have the same, you know, features, right? Like functionally. But, you know, um, maybe the way one is designed over the other just makes more sense. And so going back to that creative part, that part that, you know, um, is able to innovate on UX and UI design gets the edge, at least for now, right? Like, and it's always going to be like that. It's always a for now, which is, you know how it generally is in tech, right? Like we've had people copy our stuff on, on my old company. And, you know, there's a part of me that just laughs. Like I was, someone's like, are you, aren't you angry? I'm like, they have copied every poor decision I've made. <laughs> like, you know, and I know the problems with that. And I'm in actually the process of fixing them. So good for them. They just invested hundreds of thousands of dollars into something that we're actually leaving. We're walking away. We're we're already on the V two, right? And they're and they just finished copying V one. So, you know, I think that there is um, there's always that piece, right? So if you're constantly innovating, and you know you're in a state of build, measure, learn, like a true kind of you know product kata cycle, 
then you're going to stay ahead, right? As long as you you really have that innovation around like user experience uh, and you know a UI that really delights people, right? So and that's that's been a huge focus for us too. Yeah, I mean, I, I put it in one of my newsletter posts the other week, but I and I've talked about it. It's kind of become a bit of a catchphrase. I, I made it a catchphrase at a talk I did a few many years ago, and it was like people can copy your product, but they can't copy how you do product. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we neglect that as part of our strategy, right? And and I think that's somewhat what you're saying here. And also, I think that's also one of the things that ties into how do you prepare for the future? Like if we don't know, if if you've got this, you know, massive ice box of ideas that we can pull out if if certain you know, levers change, i.e. the cost, uh, the business viability side or feasibility side. Uh, how do you remain flexible to be able to to adapt to those? And those who can adapt to it the quickest is probably going to be the one that that wins there, right? Yeah, absolutely. And and there are technologies, right? Like we talk about AGI, but that's so, you know, that's like a thing that it doesn't exist yet. But there are things that exist that, should start getting people thinking about how this ties to the products you build, which is like large action models, which is like, I don't know if people know like that rabbit R1, uh, it was that orange device that just got brutally destroyed in all the reviews, right? <laughs> uh, it's this thing that doesn't really, it's somewhere between a cell phone and like a personalized AI and how you can just talk to it and be like, get me an Uber and, you know, like, or whatever, you know, they were, you know, pushing at the time in terms of their marketing materials, but it's not like, okay, we can laugh at that now, but trust me, like you won't be laughing about it in a year and you'll be wish you had, you, you'll be wish you had thought about like, how do we bring like large action models into our software, right. Or into wh whatever you're building. I don't think it matters. It's just like, are you, are you sitting around taking the time to research and think about the possibilities and work with your technical team to kind of push those boundaries of what you think you can and can't do and, and start to experiment? Um, yeah, so I think, yeah, you can look ahead because there these technologies are out and then people can laugh at them now and like, oh, they suck and, you know, but they won't suck eventually. And that's what you have to kind of prepare for. Yeah, for sure. Like, I think timing's a huge part of it. On this point, there was a question here. I'll, I'll throw this one up because sure. I think it's, it's relevant to what we're talking about. So how do we use curiosity to uh, play a part in moving from grunt work to strategic work? Um, I think it's a cultural question, at, you know, at, at a company, like, are your leaders, whether, you know, you have a head of product or CPO or whatever it looks like, right? It's, it's going to look different in each company, but are they giving you the time to actually at the breathing room to do this stuff? And I think that's, that comes down to like, what's important to the company and like whoever is in product leadership, you know, is that something that they're fighting for, you know, and that, that's kind of the hope of some of the stuff that we do is like, okay, if we can take this grunt work away, you'll have that time back. Um, and, and I think that is, that is what I hope, you know, product leaders out there will do. will actually say, okay, now that, you know, it doesn't take that long to write a spec or, you know, a PRD or whatever it might be. Let's now like take the rest of our day to go into our little think tank and throw spaghetti on the wall, right? Like that's, but you got that. That's a cultural shift, right? You have to like do that, you know, and and, and make that an activity. Uh, hopefully, I answered the question. I think that's what it was getting at. But yeah, yeah. Like, so let us know if it you didn't, or if you have a follow up question. The the thing that I was going to add on to it, if I may, was that, and and I know you and I've talked about this before, especially around uh, align with, and I might ask a question around this uh, in a minute too. Uh, which is that I think you can, I think as product leaders and as companies and company leaders, right? Like you're, you're a founder, you run, you run a company, I run a business too, right? Like uh, there's, a, there's also a question on us and there's, and there's a bit about, well, what do we believe in? And do we see this as a cost cutting exercise? Like, oh, great, AI is awesome. 
I can just get rid of 50% of the workforce and we'll just be cheaper. Or do we see it as, oh my God, I have all these really smart people and I just freed off 50% of their headspace to now be able to think and get in that think tank and, and be able to, you know, get curious, I think is what they're saying there. To do, anybody who came to the webinar last month, um, I talked about explore and exploit, right? Like there's these two different modes. You can Google the continuum right around explore and exploit, but it, the idea is that you don't want to get trapped in this local um, optimization of just exploiting what you have. You need to also ensure we just spend in time exploring and curiosity would do that. And maybe if we could free up some time, we could spend more time in explore, which is really where innovation is is found. Yeah. Right. Right. And I think, I think, you know, if anything, the experiment will be like, let's cut costs, you know, we have one less PM, right. And then they're getting eaten up by their competitors and they're like, oh shit, you know, they're going to have to rehire and get people thinking, but like, yeah, if you are a company that cares about surviving, you know, in in this environment, like you, that's what you're going to have to do. You know, you're going to have to somehow. Um, and, and I think this isn't just product. Like I I have recently been experimenting with our support team um, and retooling them from a support team into a product team. And saying, well, forget it. You're not support anymore. Okay. And starting to give them like product knowledge and product thinking, because a lot of what you see happening with products like intercom, which I love, I love intercom. I've used a lot. Yeah. I'm not going to make, I'm not going to like do a promotion anyway. I, I like intercom, but you can see what they're doing with AI, which is like, there's a lot of it that eventually is going to reduce the need for as many you know, customer support people. So we're going to have to retool them. And and if we can retool them and make them a part of the product team, because I think a big complaint in product is like, we're, you know, we reached out to a hundred customers and three people replied, right? <laughs> like three people actually talked to us. It's like your customer support team is talking to people every day, you know, and there's no reason why every ticket couldn't be an, an interview opportunity, right? And so that they become a part of the product team and a part of that um, team that feeds information um, into product, whether it's power, you know, whether you're using tools powered by AI to help you make decisions around product or not. That, what I mean is just like, just like, not just what happens today is like they just push like, feedback or um share it on a stand up or whatever like here's what i'm hearing and you know but i think to actually be a part of the solution and be like okay we're gonna talk to those people we're, we're, we're gonna understand like really like get down to like why this is happening and where they you know failed in the process and have access to the tools to actually maybe look at a session recording and really document this stuff and and report it um you know to their department, which is now product, right? So I think that those are some thoughts of mine. And when we talk about AI and retooling and what happens to those support agents, well, maybe they do become a part of the product team and they're just taught like product principles and product thinking and um, it's an investment, but it, it, it would give a company an edge, right? And I think that's kind of the stuff that, you know, we're doing now. And a lot of times we just do what we've seen. We're like, oh, that company has a support team and Let's just do it exactly like them. But I think that there are other ways to do it. And I think you can, if you sit down and put the, the energy, thought and time into it, I'm sure this applies to other departments as well, you know? Yeah. And like, I didn't expect us to go down this path, but I know, I know you and I've talked about this before and I love this. So I just want to make it very clear to people. So if anyone's very curious, cause I think I love this. So this is a great example of exactly what we we're just talking about. So you're looking at it rather than going, well, I can cut out the amount of support stuff I have. You're going, no, wait, I got like these support people and okay, they, they don't need to do as much support anymore, but they still need to do some support. They still need to have some customer interactions. How do I do that in a way where, or how do I start to make the most of some of the extra free time? And you've started to train them to be more product people. You've given them the skills and the knowledge around product thinking and also around customer interviewing and user interviewing. And, and uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but 
I remember when we spoke about this uh, once, uh, you're talking about how you're you're making them view it as like a customer, in, like every customer interaction is like oh, a customer absolutely. interview. Every ticket is yeah. an interview. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, yeah, I was gonna say, and then just to be very explicit, like rather than the, the current world that a lot of people find themselves in, and I'm sure people listening are in this world right now where the support staff hears something from customer, they write it down and it's like, Customer said this sucks, or like uh, they don't like <laughs> yeah. this, and you and then you're like, okay, that's not super valuable. I now need to work out why don't they like it, what don't they like, what are they trying to solve. You're making them kind of do that work and sit down with the customer, and when they say I don't like this, to make them go, well, okay, can you tell me a bit more about that? Can you walk me through it? Can you, yeah, and then document that. Yeah, tell me more. Right, because the reality is we don't have time to talk to every customer, and even if we do free up our time. To do that, there's only so many people we can talk to. And so if you can leverage each one of those, you know, users reaching out um, and to be able to not be focused on how fast you can close a ticket, because that's usually the metric, right? It's like, oh, you know, this week we've been, you know, our average ticket close was, you know, whatever. You yeah, know? Main time to resolve. That's it. That's it. Yeah. It's like, okay, <laughs> well, you know, those metrics start to shift and it's like, if you can extract information from a customer that's having a difficult time with either your user interface or something about your product, maybe your onboarding process or whatever. And they're not just going to like push it into whatever tool you have and say, you know, customer doesn't like, you know, UX or whatever, or, or had a problem, you know, whatever it's, it's like, okay, well now you as a product person get that information and you got to go do the research and, and why not just, why not just deal with it then? You know, that's a frustrating part for us. Like just if they had, the, if they had the tools and the skills, um, to take, like turn a ticket into an interview opportunity, then yeah, that should happen. And you actually just end up creating a lot more efficiency for the company and for, you know, you know, the, the product, you know, so, yeah. No, I totally agree. Um, there's a few questions about prompt engineer, engineering in the chat that I want to get to in a, in a second, but I want to just go, so uh, talk about align with the problem that you're solving. And oh. what, I'm, what I'm keen about is like, how do you see it creating more space for this? Exactly what we're talking about, right? Like, like what problem are you solving and how does it help hopefully companies and teams be able to have more time to, to do the more strategic work, do things like this? Yeah, I mean, I think <clears throat> for us, I think what it comes down to is communication, right? Like every relationship, personal or business, a lot of problems that surface usually result in some misunderstanding around communication. <laughs> um, product people have to communicate a lot to a lot of different stakeholders, and they're dealing with a lot of technical information. And so we wanted to create and or leverage, you know, the technology and AI to be able to take technical information to create instantly shareable content to your non-technical stakeholders. And that means um, automating not just like content, like like LL, like using LLMs to just like you know rewrite stuff or translate stuff, but to automate like design as well. So. Again, if you think about it, if I have a, a release, I'm not going to take my design resources and say, hey, can you make this like really pretty for everyone? <laughs> like, it's just, you're going to dump it in a Confluence doc or you, you're going to put it somewhere that, hey, I checked the box and I did it and I used a template. But regardless, even if you have those templates, it takes time. And the person on the receiving end of that information is frustrated and this is what I've seen. Even when we work really hard on that process, um, the information tends to be overwhelming. So yeah, our main focus is to, you know, essentially take that technical information to create, use AI to create instantly shareable content all within the framework of a product management tool. So essentially uh, we are taking a product management tool and um, making it uh, communicate what you're doing, why you're doing it, and how you're going to get it to market um, with very little effort from a PM. Yeah, and just to give like a, a an example, uh, those who might have been at the webinar a couple of months ago when I talked about roadmaps, talked about roadmaps being a communication tool, talked about how 
uh, it's important to understand who your target audience is. And therefore it's not uncommon for product managers to have multiple roadmaps. And one of them might be this more high level one for the executive team that's generally a little bit more beautified and looks a little bit nicer, but it's a high level of information. And, uh, and I guess you're trying to help solve that problem too, to be able to ingest a more lower level roadmap and even output something for those audiences in a different format. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think when you show a roadmap to a lot of non-technical people it can feel overwhelming. It's just a checkerboard of cards and we take that and we turn it into something that, you know, is engaging and beautiful. Right. And that's, so that's like one less thing that you have to do as a PM is somehow create a new format for this roadmap that other people can make sense of, you know, and not just the technical team. And I think that, that applies to everything, whether it's uh, turning a PRD into an idea presentation or turning your release notes um, into instantly shareable uh, content so that the rest of your go-to-market teams knows what's coming out um, or your customer facing change log of taking like all that information that you have uh, in, in that release and turning it into something that your customers can make sense of and just leveraging AI to do what it does good, really, you know, really good right now, which is, you know, taking either large amounts of data, summarizing, translating, um, and, you know, being able to do like these, these like focused tasks, you know, and then that's how we're applying it today. Yeah. And I could just say like going through the list, like here's an hour saved, here's an hour saved, here's an hour saved. And it kind of adds up over, over time. Just because there's a prompt engineering question here too. Uh, huh. Is there any prompt engineering we've, we've aligned with? And on yeah, top of that, I'm lot. keen to answer this question. So I was like, <laughs> let's talk about prompt engineering in the sense of, of align with and then um, get your thoughts on prompt, prompt engineering. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, for us, you know, I think that's where, the, you, you know, when you're when you're putting when you're creating something the output is going to be based upon how well you you know engineer um those responses and and how much detail you give the ai and how much context and it's like a constant thing that you need to to refine and build on and it's also a moving target because as these algorithms change so do like the outputs of those prompts that you've written you know anyone can write a prompt. It's just, are, are you writing prompts better than the next person? And are you doing it in a thoughtful way? Um, or at least pushing perhaps, um, s spending enough time to really get the output that you want and also monitoring that output, um, to see whether, you know, your responses are, are changing. Uh, and there are some tools for that, um, out there. Um, that that can kind of monitoring like those prompts and how they're changing over time, so you can keep an eye on that stuff. But yeah, uh, hopefully I answered that question. I, you made me think about something too, because like even the when you said the output is so largely dependent on the the prompt as well. The sometimes that's a moving target as well. I guess like do you see do you see pr the prompts also being in AI products being a moving target is probably how I would surmise that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, because each time a new model comes out um, and there's a lot of companies pushing new models and there's a lot of like shifting and testing between these models. Right. So like, you know, we will use open AI, we will use Anthropic, um, you know, now we're experimenting with Llama. Like there, there are just, you know, things that they do well. And it, that's, a, it's a moving target. These, these companies are shifting in technologies. One is trying to outdo the other. And now, you know, you, you need to be able to just take the best of what that does at that time and apply it to your use case. And that is going to change. So you can't just sit back and go, yeah, yeah, we did it. We did it with, you know, whatever anthropic, but you know, <laughs> Three months later, OpenAI comes out with a new model that just crushes that. And then it goes back the other way where like now, now, you know, Anthropic just released a new version of Claude, you know, and then you're, you're, you're trying to see whether, you know, you're going to get better results off those prompts or, and you'll have to rewrite those prompts, you know, based on as those models change. So yeah, it's, maybe that is like a new, <laughs> like a new job, right? It's like, I am the 
prompt monitor, you know, like it probably exists already. I'm not sure, but I, you know, that, yeah, those things are changing. And if you, you, you build the infrastructure in a way where you like, you know, cause these are just, you know, API calls, right? Like, you know, you can call, right. You can call, you know, one or multiple AI. So yeah, I mean, even for us, we use both open AI and Anthropic at the moment. So, and we're constantly, you know, curious and experimenting with other technologies. So I think that's, yeah, a moving target. So talking about it being, being a role in itself and a skill in itself, like, I mean, that's kind of the, the crux of this question. Like, do you, do you see it as becoming a important enough skill being treated similar to coding? Um, yeah. Maybe, you know, I, it's a good question. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think that right now it's like everyone kind of jumps into it, at least where we are. It's like, you know, myself, the developers, and you know, we start going through, um, you know, how we're going to design these prompts and we just keep, keep pushing in and keep pushing in. And they're like, all right, that's it. That That's an awesome response. This is exactly what we were looking for. Um, and then, you know, yeah, like, then we look back at it, like, I don't know, a month later, and we're like, well, this could be better. You know, <laughs> we have to go back in there and start re re engineering that prompt because we think, you know, actually we can get better results as that, you know, as that technology changes and new models are being released. So yeah, I don't know if prompt engineering will be like a, a, a job description. It'd be, you know, I think partially that's because like the way that the way that it looks today, right? Like we, we, you know, it's good at these like more like very focused tasks, but as you know, general intelligence happens with AI that, that may start to change. Yeah. I wonder if my headspace went like, it's very early days. So it's very hard to put, <laughs> to put like a stake in the ground there, uh, but definitely potentially, I mean, it kind of ties back to that previous question about prompt engineering, about having, um, like templates, like templates to, um, for, for prompts. And maybe we'll start to get to that space mm -hmm. where people will start to find patterns and be like, well, these are, and then it becomes a skill that you can learn. Like, how do you know what kind of pattern to apply in what specific words, or, you know, if you give it three versus five adjectives, like, is that too many, too little too like, uh, so I could see that, but I think it's, uh, I mean, like I'm similar to you early days, so it's hard to, hard to know. Yeah. It's hard to know exactly whether that will actually become a skill set or whether AI will surpass that. My assumption is AI will surpass what we're doing with it today. And it may not even need the engineering, right? Like as uh, the way that we think about it and, and, and use it today. So that's the possibility. <laughs> is this where it's, you know, heading. I mean, I think you can create more like specialized, you know, feed it data, but it will be able to kind of almost think and process information the way, the way we do and eventually get to that point. And then, you know, what, what do our jobs look like? I think it is maybe just like feeding the machine, you know, <laughs> it's <laughs> like here is our AI product manager and you have a bunch of product managers just kind of like correcting it, feeding it, you know, like a baby, like, oh no, you know, yeah. <laughs> trying to raise it, you know, clean your face, you know, or whatever, trying to raise this thing to become like, you know, a super PM. And so, yeah, it could look like that too, where, I mean, the product manager is the AI and you have a bunch of, you know, specialized people making sure that it's doing the job it's supposed to do, but. I don't know. That's a fantasy. I'm just like, I'm just like, I'm just making stuff up right now. <laughs> it is kind of like a fantasy that just popped in my head where it's like, we are just feeding the machine, you know? It's, 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 a, it's an interesting one. Cause I think it comes back to what we talked about at the start, which is, um, if we can't solve the AI eating its own self, like, uh, then you always need someone feeding it to make sure that we're feeding it with fresh data and information and, uh, and that could be a solvable problem, as you said, but, uh, like if it's not solvable or at least not in the short to medium term, then you're going to have this, then product reshapes cause becomes more gathering that information and inputting it and then validating the, the stuff that comes out. 
Uh, but then if we do solve that, that becomes different again, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. And also like where the technologies are going with, you know, Apple vision and, you know, we have our clamshell laptops and this is how we operate. And this is the framework that we, we, we are trapped in. We are trapped in like this idea of what we use today and things like Apple vision or, you know, like the meta quest three and, and, you know, like that stuff is going to get lighter. It's going to get easier. It's, you know, so how, what is like, we really push this forward. Let me say, what does product management look like without a clamshell laptop? Maybe that, maybe that's the big question. Like, you know, for sure. I don't, I don't have the answer and maybe that's, there's a business. Definitely there. very, very, um, <laughs> you want to start planning, uh, you know, yeah, it's definitely a very existential um, uh, you know, place to place to go. <laughs> um, we got a few minutes left because uh, I, I okay. planned for just an hour for these, uh, but we had one more question, which might be less existential to leave it on. So maybe we'll okay, go with nice, this one. Nice. It ties back to kind of what we talked a bit about at the beginning about the models always changing. We talked about it a bit more just a minute ago too, about you know chasing, chasing that, that thing. So like Kurt, Kurt was asking, um, yeah, do we need to constantly chase the new models if we can achieve it with the current like you know GPT-3? Do we need to replace it? Your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, um, the the North Star metric is a very, it's a very, I would say I'm very passionate about staying on target. And so, um, you know, just to mention align with for a second, it's like part of what we're doing is to also make sure that we're building true North, right? So being able to connect everything you do to strategy. So I think that's one thing that you can kind of like that doesn't necessarily have to compete with wanting to create AI features in your product. So I think I would say, you know, part of that first part of the question is we focus on our own North star metric and goals. Absolutely. That's like, that drives everything you do now, whether, um, that's, you know, GPT three or four is throwing off your goals. They, they shouldn't, they should, they, they might, make them look a little bit different because you now can do something with it that you couldn't do before. Right. And I think that's the big question is, you know, is 4.0, um, you know, better than, you know, 3.5, you know, turbo, right? Like if it's not, stick with 3.5 you're gonna save a lot of money. <laughs> you know, that model does everything you need it to do. Um, so yeah, um, don't bring a Ferrari to a go-kart race. I mean, I guess that's the thing, right? Like if, you know, bring a go-kart, if that's going to do the job, yeah, that's what you should use. So yeah, you, you know, I, I would say like chasing models and strategy, I see as separate things, but definitely chasing a model shouldn't throw your, uh, your strategies off, right? So your, your company and product objectives, it might make them look a little different because you're like, oh my God, look what we can do right now. Oh my God, what do we do with this? You know, <laughs> like this changes everything, right? Like it, it could happen, you know, and, and, and it should happen, right? Like you don't want to ignore the technology that is going to perhaps give you an edge in your product, at least for the time being. Yeah, I like I like your delineation between strategy and the model, right? Like it comes back to AI is not your strategy. <laughs> like you need to have a strategy. You need to know what you're trying to achieve. Right, yeah. If you can achieve it with a go-kart, don't buy a Ferrari. Um, the caveat that I throw on that is uh, don't fall into the local optimization trap. Like don't miss the opportunity to develop Formula One, <laughs> right? Yeah, like yeah. Th does that mean we invest heaps of money and we make sure that we're always on the latest? No, but it just means that we keep an eye on what's happening. And we we make sure that oh what what you know what what is for opening up that we can't do today oh that's interesting does yeah. that align do we care no okay cool we wait till you know four point three or five or whatever like and then we go okay now there's something interesting but if you ignore that you end up like Kodak right uh, and you miss yeah. digital cameras yeah and if you want to bring the best experiences to your users um, yeah you're gonna have to have someone you know looking at the new models that are coming out. And just, you know, if you can redirect your API and all of a sudden create a better experience for your customer base, well, why, why wouldn't you? Right. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of another thing is like, um, 
even if it's not like major improvements, if, if, if they're significant enough and it's worth it and it's financially feasible for the company to support those costs based on what your users are paying monthly, then yeah, you should, you should go for it. But on the flip side, listen, if you can get the job done with, you know, a, you know, less expensive model, um, and yeah, you should do that for the business, right? Especially, <laughs> you know, if you want to, you know, have higher profitability, right? So yeah, spot on. I I, I absolutely agree. Look, Kanan, this has been a pleasure. Yeah. Uh, we spent uh, we talked a lot about um, AI more than I I thought we would, but that's okay. I think there's a lot in there. Uh, hopefully, we answered some of the questions in the chat. If we didn't, just let us know. You can. I'm going to say it on your behalf, but I'm sure you can. You can I'm sure, sure you're going to agree with it. But feel free to to tag Kanan in it and and send him a, a question if you if you have it. Oh, absolutely, yeah, for sure. Last thing would be um, if people want to learn more about Align with, if people want to learn more about yourself, where can they connect? Yeah, give us. Yeah, just reach out to me on LinkedIn. That's probably the best place. Um, if you want to check out um, our platform, you know, it's AlignWith.io. Um, and you know, if you want a demo, I'm happy to give you one. You don't have to get, um, caught up in the freemium. If you have questions, just, yeah, feel free to reach out. I'm, I'm, I'm reachable. So amazing. Thank you. I mean, personally, I think align with yourself in a very interesting space, uh, communication alignment, trying to leverage AI to help save those, you know, couple of hours a week and stuff, I think is uh, for now and obviously the future, maybe even more time, but I think that's a. It's a big space um, already, and being able to free up the time to do something else is is good. I know, I know too many. I know I was. I mean, we talked about this, like how much time you spend on documentation and communication and emailing. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, and just trying to save that time is great. Yeah, and I think you know another part of that is just like creating more harmony in the organization. If people know what they're doing, why they're doing it, they have more sense of purpose behind the work that they do, and less friction, less finger pointing, less of the stuff that happens when you have poor communication couldn't agree more on that point we're uh, on time so we're going to call it there All right. thanks Heath, for good. having uh, for coming along Kanan. thanks for the conversation thanks everyone for joining uh we'll see you uh, hopefully at a future one next month or something like oh that. yeah yeah let's do it